Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And please pray with me. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Savior and our Supplier. Amen. Well, if you were here last week and you listened to my sermon seven days ago, I have a bit of a confession to make. Because one of the central foundational ideas of what I preached last week during our service on Sunday was Mary's song from the first chapter of Luke, known as the Magnificat. And in that sermon, I said that all of Jesus' actions and lessons and teachings must be examined through the lens of Mary's song, that her prophetic utterance foretold what God would accomplish through the incarnate Christ. She sang about it with such certainty that the things yet to come she sang as if they had already taken place, so certain she was that God would accomplish these good things. Bringing food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, abundance to the meek, and such that they would also, that God would also send those with an overabundance away, so that all folks might flourish in the kingdom of God that is continuously breaking in to this world we live in. It was, in my most humble and uh, unbiased of opinions, a very good sermon. It deftly juggled these theological ideas and concepts, hopefully landing in a way that resonated with those who heard it. But my confession is this. I wrote that sermon without having the foresight to look ahead to this week's readings because apparently we are celebrating the feast day of Mary, mother of our Lord, and the main gospel text is Mary's song, the Magnificat, from the first, Luke, the first chapter of Luke's gospel. So, if this sermon sounds a little bit like a broken record, in some ways it is, <laughs> and in other ways it's because I lacked foresight. So now that we have set the stage, here we go. But I am still here, ready to rise to the occasion to preach on the Magnificat, and if I'm being completely transparent and honest, I am thrilled to have yet another opportunity to preach upon this text. If it were up to me, I would probably preach on this in some fashion every single week of the year, if I could do so without risking my messages growing stale and predictable. So. Before we get to this central passage, though, from Luke's Gospel, I want to take some time to dwell and explore the other two texts that we heard this morning, because there is richness and goodness to be found there as well that will only help us understand what it is that Mary sang about. So we begin with Isaiah, one of many, many prophetic books from the Old Testament wherein individuals, prophets, were given the word of God upon their lips and hearts for the purpose and intent of speaking a word of truth to God's people. Usually this involved telling the people of Israel that they were no longer living in accordance with God's covenant and that God would soon bring punishment and wrath upon them if they continued to shirk their promises to God. Now, today's particular reading comes from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, 
a section of the book that takes place after the doom and gloom that Isaiah prophesied in the beginning of the book actually happened. We hear the words of the prophet after the Babylonian Empire has conquered Israel and scattered them across the land to live a life of exile no longer within the promised land that they were given by God. Which is why I find it so striking that the imagery that is used towards the end of this passage is all about joy, promise, and restoration in the form of a garden. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations, the prophet writes. What struck me about this passage is how in the midst of extreme displacement, in one of the worst things to happen to this nation of Israel, God's people, in their entire history, the thing that the prophet chooses to say is God is not done here. There are good things to come. How radical it is, how incredibly faithful to look at a world completely flipped on its head, an entire nation of people displaced from their ancestral home, and to say, let us rejoice and celebrate and praise because our God is not done yet. Our God is one of growth. Our God tends to the garden, even amidst the dirt, the grime, the muck, the soil, God grows beautiful things, and God is not done yet. What a word for Israel to hear, and what a word for us to hear today. What a word indeed when we hear this concept echoed again through Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. This garden of righteous goodness is not exclusive only for a few select people, Paul argues. This world of generative goodness that God is all about is for all people because we have been adopted into the fold. It is no longer about were you born in the right nation, were you raised in the right way. God's family is open and welcome and inclusive to all This is a necessary and important element of every single letter Paul ever wrote. And indeed, his life as a missionary in the early days of the Jesus movement was hinging upon him spreading this message. To the people he served, there were a great many questions and anxieties about who was allowed in, who was to be kept out. Is this the right way to do this? Is that the wrong way? Help me out, Paul. I'm confused. And people would get so hung up on the fact that they were not born and baptized or circumcised in the right way because all these other missionaries were trying to tell them different things. And Paul's answer is so confident that it's almost defiant. Nobody is excluded from God's love. Nobody at all. In fact, we all are welcomed in, adopted as children of this same God who is bringing forth a new reality even as we speak. Regardless of your birthright or heritage, God adopts all people into the fold through which Jesus works. All people now receive the same inheritance, the richness of the coming kingdom, the gift of of the garden that God is growing, this generative space for all to dwell within, to tend to and maintain. What a way to counteract the turmoil and deconstruction of the world at large that we all might bask in this inheritance freely given, filled with the Spirit of God who was with Jesus We are no longer beholden to this world and its unjust machinations. We are children of the promise, heirs of this inheritance, the Holy Spirit within our bodies, the Holy Spirit who was at the beginning, the same Spirit that Christ breathed upon his disciples and into us. Which brings us to the subject matter of today's feast day. Mary, the mother of our Lord, and the song she so faithfully sang when she learned that she would be the one 
to bring forth God in human form to this world. If it wasn't clear in last week's sermon, I absolutely adore this passage of Scripture. Not just for its poetic beauty, which is merit enough on its own, but for the ways in which it grounds the story of Jesus in human existence. It is this almost terrifying thing that God, who created all of the cosmos, would step into the confines of human form. But it isn't just about God taking on this physical body, but being grounded and rooted in the human experience with all the joys, the sorrows, and everything in between that comes with it. And it is through Mary's body that God enters this world, taking on flesh, blood, human emotion, with Mary as the catalyst through which it takes place. There's a Greek word that has been used to refer to Mary throughout the centuries, Theotokos, which means God-bearer. Mary literally bears God into this world by birthing Jesus into existence. And Mary's life revealed the presence of God made flesh. It revealed God's presence among the humble and poor. And her song spelled out what God would accomplish through Jesus, yes, but also through those who encountered and followed his teachings. In the Gospel of Luke, where most of the readings have come from this year of the lectionary cycle, Jesus spends a great deal of time preaching and teaching on what the kingdom of God is like. And Mary, in her song, gives us a foreshadowed view of this kingdom. Typically, I tend to focus on the more justice-oriented aspects of the Magnificat when I preach on it. I have a knack for really being gravitated towards the themes of tearing down tyrants and sending the rich away empty, scattering the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And while I think it is important to highlight and remember the ways that God chooses solidarity with the poor and oppressed time and time again, I also think it's important to highlight and remember the ways that Mary knew just how radical and world-changing Jesus' life would be. Today I'm struck by how Mary also sings goodness, promise, and growth. There is prophecy here, yes, and there is joy, there is praise, there is nourishment and promise. The coming kingdom of God is a world oriented to God's justice, but that also means it's a place where people have what they need and can coexist peacefully and sustainably. God certainly is in the business of bringing down systems and cycles of injustice, but never without the promise of something new taking its place. Even as Israel was in exile, God promises the growth of a garden. Even in a world scattered and beset by multiple narratives of multiple missionaries, God promises inheritance and belonging in the family of God. Even today, with uncertainty and division growing by the day, God promises goodness, belonging, and an inheritance of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is like a garden. This is the vision of the world we are adopted into. This is the work the Spirit brings forth in us. This was the vision of Mary, Theotokos, the God-bearer. And for us, as adopted children of God, we too receive the inheritance of the kingdom, as well as the gift of the Spirit that we might rise to new life every single day. And so remembering this inheritance, may we all embody the Spirit. May we all emulate Mary and bear God in our own lives and in our own way 
so that by the grace of God, we may all work to grow a new world of love and promise with one another. In the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. <laughs>